Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. Thanks for joining us for this special podcast recorded at a PRI luncheon in San Francisco on June 14th. We were privileged to have as our guests two Berkeley professors to talk about what else? Diversity, equity, and the recent attacks on free speech on college campuses. Law professor John Yu and PRI senior fellow and political science professor Steve Hayward discuss their experiences and provide their perspectives as faculty members at UC Berkeley, perhaps ground zero in this hotly debated topic. Thanks for joining us. Our two speakers, um, Dr. Stephen Hayward and Professor John Yu, I'm going to introduce in a second. I just wanted to set the scene for our event today. Um, They're going to be talking to us, the audience, about the administrative bloat in running universities. The deepening ideological skew of faculties is aggravating the problem of campus conformity. University enrollment is already starting to um, decline because of demographic reasons. And of course, the whole, uh, the issue of the Oberlin College um, dispute where the bakery, the Gibson's Bakery was awarded $44 million um, in damages, which was a very exciting thing. And if people at Oberlin College are beside themselves, I mean, I think Char- one of Charles's um, cousin went to Oberlin and totally turned her into a Marxist communist. So I'm not a big fan of Oberlin. So um, Steve Hayward is the senior resident fellow at the Institute of Governmental Affairs uh, at UC Berkeley and a visiting lecturer at the UC Berkeley Law School and, of course, um, a senior fellow at PRI. And I hired Steve back in December 1991, so he was our second hire. Lisa Sawyer, who was here, was there when I joined PRI in 91. So Steve has been affiliated with us for a very long time. He was a Ronald Reagan Distinguished Professor at Pepperdine and also was the first conservative professor in a special program at University of Colorado Boulder, uh, 2013-2014. I think the most exciting thing about Steve is he's one of the people behind Powerline. If you don't read Powerline every day, you should. And the best thing on Saturday morning is the weekend pictures. Charles and I are in hysterics every, every Saturday morning looking at the weekend pictures that Steve sends out. So you must, if you don't get it, you must. And our other speaker is Professor John Yu, who clerked for Larry Silberman. We were all with Larry Silberman and John in um, Corsica a few years ago for one of John's um, conferences, which was, which was great fun. He also um, clerked for Supreme Court Justice uh, Clarence Thomas. He's been um, a Fulbright Distinguished Chair um, in Law at the University of Trento in Italy, the University of Chicago, Chapman University. He's written several books, and he hails from Philadelphia. And when his wife doesn't want to go on trips with him, his mother is very keen to go, and they're going to Machu Picchu in Peru uh, soon. So please uh, welcome our two panelists, Dr. Stephen Hayward and Professor John Yu. So I, I thought what John and I thought we would do is uh, have a bit of a conversation. I'll throw out a few initial propositions, then we'll have some back and forth. You can throw out your own propositions, then we'll take some questions from the audience and just see where it goes. I thought that was better than just uh, giving you standard speeches. So uh, Sally gave you a few headlines, and I think I will uh, dilate them just slightly. Um, so the, the college scene today, beyond the headlines, I think are some... Well, I'll put it this way. One of my old mentors, M. Stanton Evans, used to have his first law of insufficient paranoia, which holds that no matter how bad you think things are, it's invariably the case that when you look closer, you find out that things are even worse than you thought. So in the case of administrative bloat on college campuses, what people typically think is that's what's running up the cost of universities. Uh, you know, the, uh, the number of administrators has soared much faster than faculty. They're all paid very large salaries. Uh, And that's true, Uh, however, there's a second part of it, which is, and there's been a little bit of work on this that has made the press and even the New York Times, uh, the administrators tend to be even worse than the faculty when it comes to deranged radicalism. And that's because a lot of these, especially deans of diversity and inclusion, uh, which, and you remember that diversity on a college campus means people look different but think the same. Uh, and a lot of them are drawn from some of the more politicized and ideological departments. Uh, and so, you know, your average college liberal professor is relatively sane compared to a lot of administrators. It's especially true at private liberal arts colleges. And, you know, Sally made mention 
of the Oberlin College verdict. And if you're not following it closely, you might be wondering why uh, did the court find a college, a private college, liable for the actions of students off campus? And one of the, one of the chief reasons was is that the dean of students and advisor to the president for diversity and inclusion participated actively in the student protest, helped the students organize, passed out their flyers, uh, sent lots of incriminating emails about how awful the bakery was, and you know, reinforced the harassment about some totally bogus charges. And the nice thing about America is we still have trial by jury, and the jury in that part of Ohio didn't think this was, uh, didn't take too kindly to all this. Uh, so I, I think that the, um, the remedy, and I'll come back to this in a couple minutes, is uh, we should, just about every university ought to fire half their administrators. It wouldn't matter which half. Things would get better right away if you fired half your administrators. Uh, I will say that uh, there are a few universities just in the last few weeks that have announced cutbacks in administrative positions, and the reason for that is declining enrollment. Uh, we're already seeing a decline in enrollment, and that is putting downward pressure on tuition you haven't seen colleges cut their sticker price, but the actual price you pay is falling fast at a lot of universities. And that's going to get worse for demographic reasons. And the reason for that is just think back 10, 11 years ago, and the world comes to an end with a financial crisis. And what happens then? Well, the birth rate fell by quite a lot. And so the pool of young people that colleges need to draw on to fill up their classes is starting down, and it's really going to go off a cliff in another four or five years. And the colleges know this. So that's going to put more downward pressure on tuition, their ability to price. And I think that's going to make a lot of them have to say, we can't afford all these $300,000 administrators. Um, so we'll see. I hope, I hope that's what happens. Um, second thing is, uh, we got a lot of good social science survey data showing that college and university faculties have, which have always been liberal for decades and decades. This is not a new thing. And always had a a certain quotient of very visible radicalism. My own view is that's where radicals ought to be. If they wreck a few English departments, that's better than having them out on the street. Uh, you know, the, the problem with the university is that their borders are porous and sometimes these guys sneak out. I mean, who wouldn't have preferred that Barack Obama had remained a law professor, right? Instead, he snuck out. Next thing you know, he's president of the United States. Okay. Um, but there used to be at least some conservatives around. You know, 15, 20 percent of a faculty overall and you could always find one or two or three in most of the social sciences and the humanities. And that number in the last 25 years has dwindled uh, dramatically, been cut by about two thirds. Uh, the reasons for that are complicated and disputed, uh, but the point is, is that colleges are even more of an echo chamber than they've ever been. And in practice, uh, a lot of good social science on this, it grows out of what you, we all know as groupthink. Uh, is the more people with a common opinion, especially an ideological opinion, spend time together, the more radical they get, the more narrow-minded they get. And that's why you see these repeated instances on college campuses of uh, uh, you know, the, the censoriousness, I call it, of students or a faculty member or a visiting speaker that strike anybody not on a college campus as utterly, I mean, unreasonable is too mild a word to describe it, right? It's completely insane and off the hook. Uh, and so that is a big problem. I think it has two consequences. Uh, one that's obvious and well known, one less so. The first consequence is, uh, if you know the data, the number of students majoring in the humanities and social sciences has also been plummeting in the last 25 years. Number of history majors is falling off a cliff, English majors, philosophy, uh, but also political science is holding its own but ought to be doing better in some ways, sociology, uh, economics is the one exception, and of course that's the most robust of the social sciences and the most successful, and also the one where you find the most you know, libertarians and conservatives and non-leftist professors, for the most part I think that's correct. Um, and I think there's a connection there. A lot of people say students aren't taking, uh, aren't majoring in history anymore because they're more concerned about getting a job. We want to study STEM subjects and business and economics. Um, and there may be some truth to that, although there's a reason to dispute that finding. I think it's because the increasingly radical content of those humanities and social science departments simply turn off a lot of students, the majority of students who are not radical themselves, not leftists themselves. And by the way, the majority of students are not. 
Uh, the largest plurality of students uh, always describe themselves as moderates to some extent. Now, I mentioned economics. Really curious thing is happening right now that I think is a canary in the coal mine. At a number of prominent universities, Columbia, MIT, I'm trying to think of where else, have a, applied with the federal government to change their official classification. It, it's a funny little thing that I didn't even know existed, but you can, it has to do with you know, various bureaucratic ways that higher education is classified and accredited. So economics departments are reclassifying themselves as STEM fields, like engineering or physics or chemistry. Why are they doing that? Well, I think part of it is uh, even liberal economists who are data-driven and are empiricists, they look around at the other social sciences and the humanities and say, we don't want to be in the College of Arts and Sciences with all these loons. We'd rather be in a more rigorous part of the university. So the point is, is uh, I think that's a, I say canary in a coal mine. I think you're already seeing a de facto divorce in universities taking place. We are rapidly coming, especially big research universities, we're moving towards a, situ a, a situation where you're going to have the, a university that is STEM subjects, economics, business, pre-law to the extent that's still done in a self-conscious way in political science, and then the rest of the university of the humanities and the goofy social sciences which will wither and die and everyone will understand they're all crazy people. And no one will, you know, want to, not one, but, you know, fewer students will want to be in those departments. And that'll be an interesting one. Um, finally, I'll mention a couple of remedies and provoke John, I hope. I already mentioned firing administrators. Uh, second, uh, one thing to do is to figure out ways to create competition within universities. I know a lot of you are familiar with things, uh, well, here in California, like the Hoover Institution, of course at Stanford, uh, also the James Madison Center at Princeton that Robbie George founded 20 some years ago. Uh, Arizona State University has set up its own new school on economic thought and, and you know, political thought that's independent of the traditional departments and is now has a competitive curriculum of the traditional departments and the faculty are not happy about that but the legislature said this is going to happen, that was nice. Uh, another idea that's been thrown around is maybe somebody needs to step up and start a new university or two, you know, a real prestigious elite university. We haven't seen something like that now since Brandeis, which is 70 or some years ago. And that's a, we can talk about that some. And then finally, uh, the, I don't want to say craziest idea, but the one that's the most remarkable, uh, not remarkable, but really unconventional is, and this is something the Trump Education Department might take up just to scare people. They say, what's all this uh, fixation with a bachelor's degree? Why don't we create some alternative way of certifying that someone is educated and capable, like we do, say for example, the CPA exam, right? So that you could take alternative methods of education, you know, online classes, study on your own, and, and, uh, the and you Kim wanna, Kardashian approach to the, passing the bar exam. Well, it could be. That's it. That would be, well, maybe. I mean, we should experiment with these things. Um, because uh, part of the story is the cartel of the accreditation agencies, which push colleges to the left, and the nature of colleges reinforcing that you're nothing if you don't have a BA. Well, maybe create some competitive avenue uh, that the, the wider world that wants to employ people will know. Here is a person who's got some skills. Right now, a lot of employers use the BA as a screening mechanism to find young people who can show they have the discipline to create a, uh, complete a course of study, and that's not bad. Um, but maybe we should be even bolder than that. So I will stop there and see if you want to add, sure. contest, whatever. Well, th I want to thank uh, Steve and Sally for inviting me to join you uh, today. So uh, getting Steve to join Berkeley is probably the only thing I've done on behalf of ideological diversity at Berkeley, other than continuing to exist and not leave the campus. <laughs> You'd be the judge of whether it's been successful. <clears throat> and actually, I, uh, I quite agree with the diagnosis uh, that Steve, oh, let me also say, I'm not a scholar of higher education policy, uh, so I think I'm here more because, uh, like, you know, I'm like Robinson Crusoe on the island. You're just curious, how did he survive and what lessons can we draw just by looking around how he made it on the desert island? Which I'm, so I'm very happy to share stories and lessons, but everything I see from being the little the, one of the few conservatives at Berkeley, quite comports with everything that Steve gave in his diagnosis of what's wrong with the university's academic uh, bloat and personnel. I think I read a figure uh, for every one new professor added to a faculty, uh, universities are adding more than 10 administrators. 
uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, there's been a huge rise in tuition, uh, often uh, subsidized by the federal government, right, through very cheap student loans. Um, and universities are using those. They're not using them to add professors. They're using them to add uh, things to attract students, like better dorms, uh, uh, you know, gyms. Uh, there are several universities that have added water, uh, water amusement parks to their campuses. Um, I always thought eating bad food was part of the college experience, <laughs> not... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I would not have met my wife if it were not for bad food in college campuses because we had to go off campus somewhere to eat. Um, but uh, one thing I would add uh, or maybe emphasize that Steve didn't emphasize as much, though I think he did mention it, is uh, one of the th I think one of the main problems with higher education today is the elevation of identity politics and racial diversity and gender diversity above all other values in a university. So if, I think if you look at what the university was before, before this, and it's not that this came late, this is where it started, I think, and now it's spreading to other parts of society. Uh, you know, a great university like a Berkeley, uh, maybe a second place kind of place like Stanford, um, <laughs> just teasing. <laughs> um, the deal was you wanted to have a faculty that did the very best research uh, for the benefit of society. And at the same time, you want students to surround those faculty so they could learn from those very best people. You know, the best professors were not the best teachers, right? You're the best professors are the ones doing the cutting edge research. So we want excellence in research. And then they were teaching the students who would be around them to learn how to take their place and do that. Right? I think that has been replaced at most of the top research universities by a desire to meet gender and racial diversity goals. And so once that becomes the highest value of university and all other values sort of take second place, of course our universities are going to suffer. And so the story about Oberlin is a great example. You have a bureaucrat and professors. You should also add that at Oberlin, it wasn't just uh, an administrator. There were a lot of faculty who were also involved in this kind of lynch mob mentality to go after this bakery, which had done nothing wrong as far as I can tell from the case, of, the, the case I read. Uh, and they see that as the most important thing that you, for the university to achieve now is diversity. And so you can see where are all the bureaucrats being hired in diversity and inclusion. I think at Berkeley we spend many millions of dollars on racial and diversity bureau bureaucracy. Think about this, one million dollars uh, could put, what, about 50 undergraduates free through Berkeley. And instead we're choosing to spend taxpayer money on gender and racial diversity issues. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Every school, every department has an officer who's paid to do this. Every time you do a search for a new faculty member, you have to write a lengthy report about how it meets gender and racial diversity goals. And of course, uh, the other thing Steve didn't get to, the terrible scandals in college admissions now. Uh, look at Harvard College. Uh, there are one or two people who came up to me before the event who admitted secretly that they had gone to Harvard College like I did. Um, I cannot believe the amount of distortion that has gone on in the admissions process just to hit certain racial diversity goals to the extent, uh, you know, take Asian students in particular, uh, you know, on the five criteria that students are measured on, they are in the top quintile on four. And then the fifth one is personality, where Asian students suddenly rank at the bottom. Uh, even though the yeah, Harvard... Yeah, no stereotypes there. No, no. <laughs> even though the Harvard admissions director admitted that most of those students had never been interviewed by a Harvard admissions officer. I think that Asians have no personality will come as a big surprise to the billion and a half people in China and the other billion in India who might be eating our economic lunch these days. So I think the interesting thing is what do you do about it? What's the remedy? So I, I differ with Steve's idea of sort of disassociating uh, what I think is true in terms of diagnosis is that universities can live in this world even prosper because what they're selling is a kind of credential that's used by businesses to hire because it shows that students can crawl through the mud and crap of universities and they're so uh, disciplined and they can persevere, well, they can do anything a corporation wants them to do. I, I wish this weren't true, but a fellow named Michael Spence won the Nobel Prize in Economics for developing this signaling theory about what education actually is. And so I can see the merits. Steve would say, well, why do we overfund these uh, left-wing crazy people in universities who are really just performing credentialing function? Let's move the credentialing function somewhere else. 
I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know they do things like this in Germany and other countries. I'm not sure it's a great idea. But my little uh, effort at reform is uh, sort of actually inspired by being one of the few conservatives at Yale Law School. Uh, we have, there's something called the Federal Society in law schools, which ex actually what the head of the Berkeley Federal Society is over there. She just graduated. Um, and she's alive, too. She didn't get killed off by anybody. And so the Federal Society exists as a debating club. It brings conservative ideas uh, to law schools, libertarian and conservative ideas. I have to say, at Yale, that was the only exposure, that's the only time I ever heard about Scalia and Thomas, actually, was at Federal Society events and not in class. And so to me, one thing we could do with reform is rather than complain about bureaucrats and how much money the university is spending, is try to create these programs to bring speakers and visiting faculty to at least expose some students to conservative ideas and get a debate uh, going. I think that might be, and for those of you who donate to schools, the best thing you could do, we all want to support our alma maters, but you don't have to give a blank check to the university to say spend on building another lazy river amusement water park to attract the best students. Instead, give money in very focused ways to programs like I think the one Steve is running with. There's another fellow, Brad Barber, who's going to start helping us run the program to bring conservative speakers to campus so that the few students and more and more, I think, will be more receptive to hearing conservative ideas can actually hear them in a, oh, in, and this is where the universities do have to step up, in a setting where there's no riot, where police aren't going to allow uh, people who are so scared of hearing different ideas that they actually want to try to engage in violence to try to suppress events. Unfortunately, Berkeley witnessed two of those uh, incidents and it's been spreading all over uh, the country. That's where I think, you know, alums, if you want to give money to a university, say, I'm going to give money to the campus police department to protect conservative speakers <laughs> on campus. That would be the most effective donation you could give. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me uh, go back. I, actually, I, I do want to say, uh, uh, because it's true, that Berkeley will never live down its long reputation, going back to the free speech movement and before. Uh, however, Berkeley is actually quite a bit better, especially in a lot of these private liberal arts colleges like Oberlin, uh, like uh, Sarah Lawrence, where Sam Abrams got in so much trouble, and Harvard and Yale, for that matter, that behaved disgracefully. Uh, and, you know, the current chancellor, Carol Christ, you know, when the left said, we're going to shut down Ben Shapiro, she said, no, you're not. And she said, I will, and, you know, the school's running a deficit. She says, I will spend whatever it takes to make sure his free speech rights are vindicated and he, the event can come off. And I was very proud and of it. It ended up being pretty boring and dull. Well, it is, but however, I mean, I, you know, I, I remember how they're going to do it. One of the problems with the campus at Berkeley is it's hard to secure. It's got porous borders. And then I showed up, and I realized the night before Shapiro was going to show up at 2 o'clock in the morning, the truck showed up and installed the jersey barriers around the perimeter and then created openings so you could have crowd control. And they brought out an immense police force, and Chancellor Chris was going to be darn sure that they weren't going to have a repeat of the Milo riot. And good for her for that. I think she deserves all, all the praise she gets for that. And the left on campus is very mad at her for all of that, right? For spending the money, and who, I mean, we hate Shapiro because, we, right. And so good for her. And but then uh, the conservatives have, uh, you know, do get some blame here. Not, uh, I think, responsible conservatives, but right. I can see like a Berkeley student, they invite someone like a Milo uh, or an Ann Coulter, they want to stick it in the face of the campus and measure. They yes. want to get the most outrageous. Uh, most uh, flagrantly provocative person. I kind of understand, yeah. but uh, it's sort of if students on the left invited people from the Nation of Islam to speak, right? They're going to, you know, it's well, going to be a campus explosion. But, well, I think conservatives yeah. should try to aim, uh, you know, maybe like a Ben Shapiro, more responsible, better debaters, people who aren't just there to, who would like there to be a riot, in other words. I think the problem is... Uh, Ann or Milo, they actually benefit too. They have an interest yeah. in there being a riot and yeah. things getting shut down. I'd like to see more people like a Heather McDonald or Steve Hayward show up at campuses and really engage in an intelligent debate with the other side. There, there's a, that's an important point. Uh, there's a good book seven or eight years ago called Becoming Right, uh, how, young, how campuses shape, shape young conservatives. And it's by two sociologists from the University of San Diego, which means they're totally clueless. But they interviewed students at two campuses, Harvard, 
and the University of Colorado Boulder. It was before I was there. And, but they also talked a lot about places like Berkeley, Santa Barbara, Ohio State, uh, you, know, you name it. And so here's the, I'll restate the question they were looking at, which is why is it that you'll get student, conservative students want to have Milo or Ann Coulter at a place like Berkeley, but not at Yale or Harvard or Princeton or name a few others. And it's not just because those are elite Ivy League schools, it's because they have what Harvey Mansfield calls conspicuous conservatism. You know, you have the Madison Center at Princeton, you have Harvey Mansfield at Harvard, you have the William F. Buckley program at Yale, which has a speaker this year almost every week. By the way, the reason they have a speaker almost every week, they're growing like crazy, is that after that ridiculousness at Yale a few years ago over the Halloween costumes, lots of alumni quit giving money to the college and start giving it to the Buckley program. So they, they've been able to expand like crazy out of that silliness, which they really like. That's why I went there a ton this last year. Um, and so the point is, is that for students who have no conspicuous conservatism, it's quite understandable that they want to give the, as I put it, the middle finger to the campus. And Milo's a handy way to do that. And what you'll find is, is that you know, conservative students at other universities, Arizona State's a good example, uh, with their new center, they're less interested in the provocative model. They're more interested in having more serious debate. Uh, and they now have, a, you might say, a home, right? They've got some backup. They don't feel isolated. Uh, and so, anyway, we're, Berkeley's a huge place. We're trying to replicate that a little bit in our own small way. Um, but that's an important point. It, it, I'll ask you a question, Steve. So even though I had this idea for reform at heart, being conservative, I'm a pessimist, and I think everything's really going to break down in the end, and we're just fighting a losing battle to maintain uh, you know, the idea that we should study the best that's ever been written or thought and try to advance the, the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, but it's hard to see turning the universities around too, uh, admittedly. I mean, even if we have a program, people bring conservative speakers to campus. Uh, having been at the Berkeley campus for 25, I just finished my 25th year, I can't see any way to turn the ship around. I think if anything, in the last 10 years, the left has added like another generator and engine on and they've turbocharged off into the wilderness. I don't, I don't see how we can... Uh, uh, you know, prevent the direction things are going, I'm afraid to say. Well, first of all, I'm, I, I have the attitude of a late Hungarian friend of mine who lived by the adage, things are serious, but not yet bad. <laughs> that may be too optimistic. Uh, he was a college professor, by the way. So uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is, is um, the good thing about human nature is that it's on our side, and that manifests itself in a couple of ways. One. Almost all students grow up and start paying taxes. That's a sobering moment for a number of students. It usually is an educational moment. Not for all of them, uh, but for some. And then the other one is, is um, uh, even in my experience, is that there are some, and usually it's the brightest of the leftist students, they're actually eager to learn something else. And they're actually kind of tired of the conformity, the narrow conformity of the left. And so I don't think it takes that much, you're not gonna turn it around, but I don't think it takes that much to create a different dynamic. I mean, that's been my experience at Berkeley and also at Boulder is the most fun students I've had have been the liberals who told me directly they wanted to hear something else. And they, by the way, to respond to it, I, I could say, I think I won't go off on it now, at some point I've gotta write an article about most conservative academics, it's not just their ideology that differs, it's their method and manner of teaching in the classroom that is different. It's not universally true, but I'd say it's true for at least half, if not more. And there's a lot to that story, and I won't go on about that right now. But you know, even non, even liberal students understand that and see that. Um, so I actually don't think my standard line about this is, uh, except I, I think this is actually true in a larger sense, is that one of us is worth 20 of them. So we don't need very many of us to have an effect on really good students who are serious about their education in the humanities and, and so forth. Um, there are several more dimensions of this I could go through. Uh, and I'll just give you one little angle on it that I have some fun with. I've been thinking for the longest time of writing an article that I was going to call, or would call, One Cheer for Ward Churchill. So I don't know if you remember that guy. His name's kind of faded, but he was that crazy guy who, for, you know, chairman of the Ethnic Studies Department in Colorado, and he got caught saying that the people in the Twin Towers at 9-11 were the little Eichmanns of capitalism who deserved it. And he got fired after that, although not for being crazy. That the, that's the real reason they fired him. 
they said it was plagiarism. They found out his scholarship wasn't any good. Okay. Um, uh, they really fired him because he was an embarrassment to the university. And the, the last thing people want is sort of sunlight and how crazy they are. But why one chair for Ward Churchill? One of the reasons that so many students do flock to these radicalized departments, you know, critical theory and gender studies and all the rest, is that for all their jargon and for all their tendentious ideology, they are asking the basic question, what is justice? And they do engage the passions of students in a way that a lot of political science courses and sociology don't. Because what do you get in political science these days? An awful lot of it is regression modeling. And not coherent, straightforward discussions of justice. So one of the things that a lot of conservatives are good at, I think, is education in the old-fashioned way that talks to students who are really trying to form their souls in a serious way. And so that, that's a competition, not just ideological, but also stylistic. And maybe, that, maybe that's too much, but um, that's yes. what I think. Being a professor at law school, we don't want anything to do with anybody's souls. <laughs> We're trying to beat, I, beat I that out of them, actually. <laughs> um, well, yeah, the soulless <laughs> profession of law, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the th so it's interesting that you see the hope in students, because I, I worry more about the faculty, and this is more just from an internal perspective. Uh, when I was hired, there were still uh, what I would call New Deal liberals, professors who were liberal, but they thought, let's have a a diversity we can agree with, ideological diversity, because it was fun to have people of lots of different views. Uh, you know, Socrates and Plato are teaching, they don't want all the people in their little symposia to all think like them, right? You wanna advance uh, ideas by having critical examination by as many different people and views as possible. I think that's disappearing if it's not already wholly disappeared from most departments, other than the science, the hard sciences. So I think in a lot of these social sciences and humanities departments, you have people who uh, don't believe in ideological diversity anymore. They would not, they won't hire uh, conservatives. Uh, I think uh, when I retire, which will be when I die many, many years ago, many, many years in the future, I hope, because they're not getting me out of there. Um, although if there was a good buyout, I would think about it. Um, but I, I, would, I would be shocked if they replaced me with another conservative. I think that the faculty today uh, don't believe, they, they think that what they're doing with diversity is just the right answer. And so you would never have people who think the wrong thing. And I think that has a lot, and the right thing these days is racial and gender diversity. And so I, even though I think you're right, the students are hungry for lots of different opinions. At the same time, I think you see faculties constricting what are considered legitimate points of view and legitimate arguments for faculty and scholarship. Yeah, so I think maybe we should turn to some questions or comments now. My name is Marianne, and apropos administration of universities, my late uncle, who was at MIT and at the ETH in Switzerland, he said that the International Students Office at MIT has as much as many administrators as the whole ETH and that was in the 50s. Um, the second thing I'd like to say, I do challenge Mr. Hayward on one thing about that the English professors can't do that much damage there um, than on the street. The problem is that there was just an English professor at UC Davis who's, who basically told the students to go kill policemen. Oh, right. And uh, this guy hasn't been fired. And the third thing I'd like to say is, and I just witnessed a student from high school getting a, uh, a scholarship by a Republican women's group. That student read an essay. I, as a teacher, think that essay was about a third grade essay. Ah. Okay, I think you're limited to three, probably just two. So uh, uh, my comment about English, you know, what's a few wrecked English departments, not a big price to pay to keep radicals off the street. I was being somewhat facetious. The, the stronger counter argument to what I said actually is that it's no longer confined to the crazy English or critical studies department. I don't know, maybe you saw this. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I guess there's some website or algorithm or ser function, search engine, I'm not sure what. Uh, but it can sweep the entire texts of every New York Times article for the last 20 years, and you select certain terms and words and see how often they're used. 
all of the jargon of the higher education left these days, like intersectionality, white supremacy, um, right? so all, all the graphs are sort of flat for the last four or five years, and the last three years, all the graphs skyrocket. And so how has this gotten in the New York Times? Well, a lot of people from these departments have graduated and been hired by the New York Times. Right? And we know they're also hired at Facebook and Twitter, and that's why they're censoring people. You know, one of the YouTube channels taken down was a high school teacher who used you know, clips of uh, uh, you know, the, the Hitler era to teach German hit, And they took that down. Because, oh, no, you, you can't, you know, it was a history teaching tool, and they've taken it down from YouTube because they're idiots. But why are they idiots? Because, you know, they're marinating this stuff. So you're right. I mean, my, I meant my comment to be a little bit flip. Um, uh, uh, but... Uh, it, to the extent that it was true that all the silliness was confined to the classroom and kids would graduate and go out and get jobs and be a little more sensible, there's less reason to think that now. Although I, I, I want to defend Steve a little bit, and, and this doesn't happen often, so pay attention. But, but I think there is this kind, you kind of reference that there is this kind of, not deal or even strongly an understanding, but you do see this uh, diversity uh, push really primarily taking place in the softer disciplines where it's harder to observe who's good or bad as a scholar. Right? So you, I think you really don't see this in physics. You don't see it in the sciences. I mean, there's, administrators are, I'm sure, constantly demanding it. But you don't, I don't think you see this kind of level of demand for diversity, or at least its implementation in the hard science departments. And once that happens, if that were to happen, then I would become really worried about the quality of our universities. because. Uh, if you look at all these international rankings of universities, despite everything we're saying, this is another quandary, American universities are far and away better than any other universities in the world. But I think a lot of that has to do with the performance of our hard science departments, which constantly win all these Nobel Prizes, continuously making discoveries which lead to great innovations in technology and the economy. Uh, and I don't think they're ranking world universities based on the quality of their English faculties or history departments. Um, so one of the few things that gives me great confidence is uh, when I review the applications of foreign students, and we get thousands of applications from China. Every time I see a Chinese student's app, uh, transcript and I see Marxist-Leninist thought one, required class, Marxist-Leninist thought two, required class, then I think maybe we will stay ahead of them for a few more uh, centuries if every student in China is forced to, but then I wonder, maybe that's a good idea for Berkeley. Maybe they're going to start requiring Marxist Leninist thought one and two at American universities too. Then our great advantage is going to disappear. I would like to uh, weigh in on what seems to be your conflation of racial, uh, uh, racially inspired ad admissions verse and gender inspired admissions, as though the two were a kind of co-equal evils. I am here to tell you, I have a daughter who graduated with honors from Bucknell in mechanical engineering and management. She's doing astronomically well on her own. However, she was bitterly disappointed when she was rejected from Cornell and UC Berkeley. So just in the, the uh, ex in theory of experimentation, she took summer school courses taught by Cornell professors at Cornell, and of course UC Berkeley professors. In both courses, in Calc 2, she got an A-plus at Cornell, beat out everybody in the class. At UC Berkeley, she got an A-plus in chemistry, and the professor came up to her and said, my dear, I don't know where you go to college, but I will personally write a letter of recommendation for you to come to UC Berkeley. And my daughter stood up, all five foot eight inches tall, and said, sir, I've already been rejected by UC Berkeley once. You will not have the opportunity to do it again. You know, obviously there are going to be individual cases where you are going to see discrimination. I'm not saying discrimination occurred here. In fact, I think that Berkeley in the sciences and engineering would love to have more women students and faculty if they could. Um, I actually would bet that what has happened, uh, and we didn't get into this, uh, but this is a longer story, but I think what has happened is that we have moved away from a system which I think of as a very meritocratic system based on SAT scores, test scores, performance in courses. Right? And we have totally moved away from that to a system of holistic evaluation of applicants, which I think, I'm afraid, is really just a cover to allow uh, admissions officers to consider race. So, so that's one. 
Second thing is look at the other college admission scandal we haven't talked about, which was the one about buying your way into college by uh, suddenly finding a sailing prodigy in your family at high schools that don't have sailing teams, right? And of course it was USC that was mostly involved in all this, wasn't it? That's another joke. I just like teasing our- Also Stanford. Our I just, yep, yeah, Stanford. Actually, Berkeley has not been involved yet. Yet. <clears throat> um, but I just like teasing our competitor schools. But once you, what to me that shows is not that uh, these things go on, it shows that when you move off of this meritocratic system based on test scores and grades and anything counts, well, of course, you're going to have all kind of gaming of the system. These people are just more obvious at it than other people because they just bribed people to get, but you're going to ha start having lots of competition flow into these other areas like activities. Who's going to do better at that, actually? That's one thing that's going to, who's going to be better at sending their kids to third world countries to build sanitation systems or to, you know, become really good at a sport or at an art. It's going to be, I think, wealthier people. And so the unfortunate thing, I think, is that this new system of admissions that all these schools are moving to, that DM, the University of Chicago doesn't use SAT scores anymore, which I find incredible. That's the University of Chicago of all places. But once these schools move away from, I think, a more merit-based system of admission, then you're gonna have all kinds of abuses and unexplainable results. Because I think what's going on is admissions officers are now using this as a cover for social engineering. I'll just add real quick that um, it's, it's been true for several years now that more women than men are going to college. It's, it's more skewed at private liberal arts colleges where sometimes it's 60-40 women to men. And especially if you get to say the second and third tier liberal arts colleges, that have, you know, the back of the east, the, you know, there's a million of them, right, it seems like. Uh, there they, they really have a struggle. You talk to admissions officers and they're terrified of going below the 60-40 ratio. They just get so many more applications from women. Uh, and it's less, so, less true of a place like Berkeley, which gets 120,000 applications a year for 11,000 spots. You can even it out at a place like Berkeley. Um, now, then just go beyond the aggregate numbers. I think it's now true that women outnumber men slightly in law school nationwide. I think they're close to even in business schools. But then you go down the whole list of the graduate professional degree programs. Uh, education, masters and above in education, PhDs, 80% women. Uh, and then you go down the other end of the scale, physics, engineering, chemistry, it's 20% women. And you can actually do the bars. I go from, you know, 80% for education and, and, and you really just see that sort of, and you know, you're not supposed to talk about these things. We're embarrassed about it. Um, but I, I, do, I do know other women who are absolutely stellar in science and I say, you know what, we may as well just play that game. Uh, not that game, but you know, uh, take advantage of that. And I know one young lady professor at a very prestigious engineering department in Iowa, and she was up for tenure, and she called me up and she says, oh, I'm getting some opposition. She'd written one op-ed article. Oh, she's got a long list of impressive publications in the scientific journals on hydrology and all kinds of fancy stuff. And she calls me up and says, ah, the dean said there's some trouble with my tenure review and approval because I wrote that one op-ed article about climate change that wasn't following the orthodoxy. And I said, look, you go into your dean and you tell him, you know, I know that all the science departments want women professors. Uh, if you don't want to give me tenure, let me know now and I'm going to get on the phone and have another job by 5 o'clock this afternoon which I think is true, by the way. And, and so, anyhow, uh, good luck to your daughter and people like that. In reference to the admission scandal, um, uh, how do you see all of this going forward um, with the decline of enrollment? Um, do you see that uh, there'll be more of this kind of abuse, or do you see it self-correcting? Um, give us your prediction, please. Oh, with, with the Harvard admissions case, uh, and there's another companion case which a group I'm on the board of the Pacific Legal Foundation is bringing on behalf of students in New York public schools because the mayor there is trying to introduce racial quotas for the magnet schools in New York City, something they used to do at Lowell High here in San Francisco, actually. Um, so there are these two cases that are moving forward. Uh, I think the Supreme Court will eventually take one of the two, and if you look 
look at the lineup of the justices, um, there are at least four justices, I think, on the court who would vote to strike down the use of race in, uh, in college admissions. Uh, it's actually quite bizarre as a matter of Supreme Court precedent that uh, race can only be used by the government uh, when it has the most compelling interests, and race is basically the only way you can achieve that interest. The only two areas the court has recognized that this can happen is wartime and college admissions. Right? It's just such an anomaly, and it's only because I think Justice O'Connor and then Justice Kennedy just felt that was elite opinion to be in favor of the use of race in college admissions. I think it's a real anomaly, if an aberration in our constitutional jurisprudence, and I think these five justices, assuming Chief Justice Roberts votes the way he has in the past, which is never a sure guarantee these days, uh, I just asked Sally about health care, but I assume that if those justices vote consistently with their past, that they will use one of those two cases to strike down the use of race, which I think would be a good turning point to restoring at least, or at least turning the direction of the ship back towards a more meritocratic university system. Yeah, so, I mean, how did we get meritocracy in the first place? That was the creation of elite universities 75, 80 years ago. They wanted the standardized tests. And then we woke up one day and said the, you know, racial and ethnic and gender distributional results we're not happy with. Uh, and notwithstanding that, or is the university the place where you start trying to fix the problems of minorities who have bad schools, you know, maybe bad family life, you know, that, and we don't, act, so actually we not take those problems that are the more fundamental problems seriously enough. So what's happening right now is uh, there have always been exceptions to the meritocratic rule. There's the legacy admissions at elite schools, athletes, musicians, people with, you know, uh, people in drama. Uh, and then as we learned, you could exploit the, I like the phrase, the side door. We found a side door to get in by bribing a sailing coach at Stanford. And, you know, most people think, I mean, the public reaction to this has been not surprising to me. Uh, People suspect that there's something rotten going on here, that sort of across the board. So I'm going on too long. I'm picking this up a lot of places at Berkeley and elsewhere that sort of you might say the liberal elite establishment in universities is now rethinking the idea of meritocracy directly. There, there are people openly speaking, maybe merit, meritocracy is not the way our institutions should be structured and organized. Uh, and I think if we actually follow that in practice, especially if the court says we can't use race as an admission factor, it's going to create chaos. And I have no idea where that's going to go, but I don't think it will be good. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the work that Mitch Daniels is doing at Purdue and his reform there and how he's been able to control costs, bring bureaucracy under control, if that's not a model for, or a sign of hope for, the, for improvement. Yeah, it's absolutely a model. So Mitch Daniels has been president of Purdue for, what, 10 years now maybe? Tuition has not gone up a single dollar. And so he said, oh, no, we're freezing tuition. And so what does he do? He does exactly what you expect a Republican uh, politician with a business background would do. So no, we don't need to buy new desks. We don't need cars in our fleet that half of them aren't used half the time. And so he just sold off assets, so we don't buy new desks, and all these kinds of, not hiring lots of people. Uh, and I'm always asking, why can't, you know, hello, why can't this be copied? Um, I think that's true too. I do wish that, uh, and I had one very brief conversation with him about this a while ago, I wish he was more aggressive in the way John Silver was 30 years ago at Boston University on curriculum reforms and whatnot. There's a couple things there where he's tried to bring in some sensible people, but you know, he, he's, he's playing his strengths and God bless him for that. But that ought to be a model for people and sooner or later people are gonna wake up to that, I think, by necessity. So I think you're absolutely right that the departure from meritocracy uh, is responsible for both the recent uh, admissions scandal involving Rick Singer, involving the claims of bias against Asian Americans at Harvard. So would a possible solution be to require the admissions process to be more transparent so that it was clear to the public just how the selection was being made, which might push towards a more merit-based process, or is it uh, hopeless to think that the admissions process uh, can be made uh, transparent in this country? You know what I want to do, um, or I want to argue for, or suggest, and watch people's heads explode, is for the really elite places like Harvard and Yale, uh, let's set a baseline to be a qualified applicant, you know, whatever test score might be. You, you could also allow room for, by the way, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I myself am, I'll put it this way in a double negative I shouldn't use, I am not uncomfortable with some aspects of holistic consideration of students that, you know, are from a bad school, but maybe a good test score, maybe you don't test well, but you've got some interesting grades, and you've got some great recommendations from teachers who are serious, and so you say, aha, this person might be able to do the work and survive. Anyway, you, you, in other words, you get a qualified pool of people, and then you admit them by lottery. Let's do that. 
And of course, the, you know, the universities, they don't want to do that. I mean, part of the legacy admissions is, we know this from the Harvard discovery process, is, oh, this person gets flagged because their parents are big donors or will be big donors, and they'll be a big donor. It is wholly corrupt, right? And, and by the way, if, if I'm a minority and you haven't hardly any minorities at Harvard 50 years ago, you look at that and you say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, you know, they may have always other problems, but that, that is an unjust privilege. And so that's why I say I'm not uncomfortable with some ways of trying to puzzle this out. And it has its problems, but let's go to a lottery system as the end game. Then it's a lot more honest. I think this is crazy, crazy <laughs> idea. Having a lottery? It could be like Powerball, though. You could just have the drawings on no, national you, you, television to get to into Harvard. What are you but, talking about? But I, I think Dan is right in the sense like what, say Berkeley, what it could do is, you know, take the names off of, you know, the identifying data off of files and have the confidence to say, here are all the people we admitted this year, right? Why not? Here are their scores. You know, if we're so proud of the values where they'll never do it. So I would just use, if I was a mission officer, I would just use, um, you know, meritocratic data, SAT scores, and college, uh, course performance, and then correct for socioeconomics, because as Steve said, there's not a, you know, some people have different obstacles to face in terms of quality of schooling. And then if the universities think that being a good sailor should put you on the, in the college of freshman class, class, then admit it, right? And yeah. I, I would think that would that would be interesting, like a Purdue could do this. See, this the one thing that universities are, though, is that university higher education is a market. It, it, the, the one maybe area to hope for is that some people, you know, theory predicts there should be some institutions which will act counter to this whole cycle and emphasize these kinds of values. And so you could see maybe a Mitch Daniels or someplace saying, well, I'm going to make the admission system transparent. And we're going to theoretically, if they start uh, admitting all the people that the other universities are not admitting because of their non-excellence you know, excellence goals, but just their diversity goals, then these other universities should prosper. That used to be the story about why the University of Chicago became a great university, because they would not play that game. Uh, but then now they're the first big university out of the gate saying we're not going to use the SATs anymore. Thank you. Uh, one of the concerns that I have these days uh, is about the attitude of students on campus about free speech. Um, when I was an undergraduate during the free speech era, uh, students wanted to be have no limits whatsoever on what they could be exposed to. Now it seems that there's a or significant... to whom they could expose themselves. Now there seems to be a significant, uh, I hope minority, but a significant group of students on the campus that are essentially demanding to remain ignorant. And what do you suppose is the, res is the origin of this chain? Yeah, what you call safe space culture and so forth? Ah. Uh, well, there's several routes to it that are deeply ideological, and I could walk through them. Uh, well, there are doctrines that say that free speech is merely a tool of power, and that's why it should be suppressed. There's no such thing as free speech. Uh, there's another doctrine that says free speech actually satisfies the old principle of physical harm. And there's always, I think, really dodgy social science studies saying that when someone is upset on a college campus, their blood pressure goes up. It's stressful. We know stress is bad for your health. And my response is, is really, is the, the knowledge that Milo is giving a talk that you're not going to, is that more stressful than the midterm exam or a paper you've got to turn in by next Friday. Seriously, and by the way, what is life about but dealing with stress? Okay, uh, I do have some fun with this, especially with liberal students, and what I do is I have them look at the Port Huron Statement from 1962, the founding document of the Students for Democratic Society, or Tom Hayden wrote it, and what's fun is they pick this up really fast because what's the disposition of that document? We want to grow up. We want responsibility. We don't want administrators looking after us. These are the things that are said in that document. We want to take responsibility responsibility. In other words, it's an anti-safe space document. And from the, just the, the contrast and the disposition between the radical students then and now, I bring this up and I do it indirectly. I don't do it directly, but the point is it's embarrassing to students now. Now, I do think it's a minority who are crazy about all this, um, but, then, but there's an awful lot of pressure on students to conform and you, lots of survey data of students showing students are afraid to tell their opinions. Not just conservative students, it's just like most students say, you know, we know that a lot of college now consists of no go zone. And so you don't even need official censorship anymore. People are self-censoring. And that's terrible. Oh, I just reminded Steve and I forgot to issue our trigger warning at the beginning of this event. <laughs> <laughs> Although I start my whole class saying well, the whole class is going to be trigger filled with trigger. So I'll just give one at the beginning of the semester. Well, and... yeah, yeah, my line is, is that I don't do microaggressions. I only go in for full tilt boogie <laughs> macroaggressions. <laughs> But 
I just want to, uh, one, one, I think one th maybe element, I agree with all the things Steve said about why free speech is declining on campus, but one other element I think he didn't mention should also be thrown in there is I think uh, all of you are to blame for raising your children the way you're raising them these days. Because a lot of students I find don't want, the number one thing they don't want to do is offend anybody else. They don't, they're so worried about sensitivities to the point where they're not willing to say maybe the sharpest thing or the clever thing uh, to advance the discussion because they're worried that someone else will be offended. So one thing I have noticed in my years of teaching is that the discussion, I have to push them harder to say things, to carry out their ideas to their logical conclusion because people are so worried about offending each other. Plus, I have to say this is an effect of the Kavanaugh hearings. Students are completely worried, I think, that anything they say from middle school on is going to be used against them in their confirmation hearings. So I think you're seeing a lot of, but you know, the Kavanaugh hearings themselves are a product of this, right, this kind of environment and culture we're living in now. And so you have, I, I'm worried, I think students themselves are, uh, I think, a lot responsible for this first, uh, this free speech, uh, this anti-free speech attitude on campus, along with the faculty and administrators. Well, first I want to thank you both. This has been a fantastic discussion, uh, but I notice in in the discussion, there is a tendency to refer to the universities as though they're a monolithic block. I wonder if you could address the issue of, the, of private versus public university. What different rules should apply to the issues that we're discussing? And among private universities, distinguish between those who take government funding, say like Stanford, who takes a tremendous amount, and say Hillsdale, that takes no government funding. So, oh yeah, so yeah, uh, Hillsdale. I've been many times. How do you get to Hillsdale? You fly to Detroit, turn left out of the airport, and drive 200 years to Brigadoon. I mean, it, it's... <laughs> It's, I mean, it's a wonderful place, but it's way off the middle of nowhere. And I always like to say, it's kind of Siberia. It's really cold in the winter. Hillsdale has to be good, or no one would go there, right? <laughs> uh, but, there, but Hillsdale and Grove City, I think, are the only two sort of serious colleges that don't take federal funds. There may be one or two others. You can, tiny little, uh, you know, uh, sectarian places you can find. Uh, I did mention that I thought private colleges are worse than public universities. I think that's true, and, and big universities, that's true for a bunch of reasons. Uh, I mean, look, a private university, I think they do have more latitude to have a speech code. Uh, now, it is the old civil rights law application. If you take federal funds, then you're bound by an awful lot of the, I mean, that's why the civil rights laws apply um, in admissions, right, for Harvard. Uh, and... Um, but I also think, so, uh, you know, a good example is um, most of the administrators at Berkeley and sort of like the diversity offices, I've met a lot of them. Some of them come from places like, I mean, the current dean, or maybe he's provost, is from the chemistry department. And I'm sure he's a liberal, but I've talked to him, and he's not one of these crazy ideologues. The dean at Oberlin, who was one of the ringleaders, she comes from, uh, I actually looked up some of her work last night. She comes from one of the crazy academic departments that teaches all the fringy theories. And the private universities tend to have more people like that in their administrative roles than public public universities do. It's not uniform, you can find exceptions. There's a few deans at Berkeley who I don't want to meet. Um, uh, but that's one difference. Um, but yeah, a public university, actually in this state, because we have the Leonard Law after Bill Leonard, which says even private universities here, and I'm not quite sure what the legal angle is this, have to protect free speech rights just as much as a public university does. So California is a little bit different. I was thinking one big difference is legal. Uh, you know, Public universities have to obey the First Amendment, and uh, they try not to, but they have to. And ultimately, you can sue them and force them to. Uh, also, in California, there's Prop 209, which uh, I think the use of race was even more obvious and pronounced even before Prop 209 than it was here. Just uh, Asian emissions, for example, in pre-Prop 209 world was always 15 to 18 percent at Berkeley, and then after Prop 209, I think Asians are about 35 to 40 percent of the class. So they're still cheating at the margin margins, but they can't cheat as blatantly as they used to. That's harder to do at a private university, right? Private university. So I, one way of saying is big public state universities are, uh, they all want to go with the herd. I mean, that's one of the reasons I think Steve is right is all these administrators, they don't want their heads to stick up above the grass. They're just going to, so because it's all of higher education is moving in this direction that these state universities move this way. You would expect private universities to just be more diverse in outcomes. So there will be some that are really bad, right? That are just the, but then there could be space for concern, uh, for private universities to emphasize a return to a more conservative style of education that should prosper when everyone else is making a mistake. So that might, oddly, you might find the so source for hope and reform in a 
a smaller private college that can show the benefits of acting against the herd mentality. Thank you for being here, and I'm going to reward you both with a really easy question, uh, which uh, um, is how much, if there is a limit, should a university have to spend on security when controversial speakers come to campus? And you, I say this, ask this against the background of two of the incidents you or spoke about, the Milo incident and the uh, all, and the high security at the Ben Shapiro, and and uh, there was I, I was there at both events, and and there was no security at the Milo event, and there was incredible security at uh, so it supposedly cost six hundred thousand dollars or something. Um, at the Ben Shapiro. So how much should a university be expected to pay? Uh, I don't have a good answer for that, but I'll give you sort of the, the contingent prudential one, which was Chancellor Chris decided that she needed to spend whatever it took to break the fever. And I think she did that by doing that. So in other words, that's a reasonable expense uh, if it was like every time. But I know I was in some of the discussions, long story why and how, but uh, well, they wanted to talk to a conservative about what do you think about, and also when Milo was threatening to come back to campus, that's a funny story. I was talking to the Chancellor in her office a lot about that. Yeah. That was, you know, then the folly, and it was all fraud on his part. Um, you remember, he kept, I'll tell you, he kept announcing speakers who were going to come with him. And then one day, Charles Murray's coming. And I thought, I doubt that. And I know Charles, so I emailed him. And he says, first I've heard of it. And by the way, hell no, I wouldn't go with that guy, right? So what's this going on? So I told the chancellor's offices, this is obviously, he's trying to fleece some donors and hoping the university will stand in her way. And Chancellor Chris was very cool. She just said, you just tell us what you need and we'll try to ensure that you get to speak. She just said, didn't make a fuss. Didn't make, didn't hit the panic button, and it all collapsed because it was a, you know, a fraud on his part. That second proposed trip, um, and the point is, but she broke the fever, and I think that. So a contingent answer is, you should spend what it takes, whatever it takes, to maintain the authority of the campus to control the camp, and that's there's no objective figure for that. So the lawyer in me has a much more pragmatic. Uh, answer that actually works, which is I would say that uh, you should, uh, to get the, because it'll have the great effect of paying for security and reducing the number of protests, which is to say every time you need to spend on security, the dollars shall be transferred from the diversity inclusion office. <laughs> dollar for dollar. I like that better. We're perfect. Well, I'm going to be uh, debating at Berkeley against a very left-wing professor on single-payer health care on September, I think it's the 19th. So I hope I'm going to have the appropriate security. I've sort of been thinking, I'm, I'm not a national name, but it's still kind of worrying when you think well, about going into. We'll, we'll have Steve yeah, we'll, out there We'll in front turn of you. up so you have at least two uh, supporters. Oh, 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 good. Thanks to our guests, John Yu and Steve Hayward. And if you'd like to join us for our next luncheon, it'll take place on July 9th in San Francisco. Our special guest is Daniel Hannon, member of the European Parliament, and he discusses Brexit and the prospects for a stronger alliance with the U.S. and the U.K. And if you're still working on your vacation plans, don't forget PRI's 40th anniversary cruise. It's filling up. Join PRI and Claremont Institute as we both celebrate our 40th anniversary on a cruise on the Mediterranean. It starts in Barcelona and ends in Rome with a special tour of the Vatican. Special guests include Andrew Roberts, author of Churchill, Walking with Destiny, and will include our own Steve Hayward and Sally Pipes. For more details, visit ci-pri.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.